Yeah, so so vegetation monitoring is kind of the the nuts and bolts of, of what I do day to day and have for about 25 years throughout the Midwest, Mid-South, collecting data, usually in conjunction with, uh, with uh, oh, fire ecology studies and long-term management uh, projects. Some of the projects we have are 20 plus years old. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a doubly difficult thing to do because you're, you're really balancing taxonomy in the field, field taxonomy and applied ecology conservation uh, concepts as, as you go along. Uh, things like like what Alan's doing with the the floor of the southeast really makes it a, a lot easier. The, the the better we can identify things, the quicker we can identify things, um, and the more we can start getting a handle on ecological concepts, the the easier this this Venn diagram of two very different different worlds or taxonomy and conservation, um, the better they start moving. Vegetation speaks volumes. Um, when you when you look at a when you look at a vegetation, when you look at the community level dynamic um, of vegetation over management time. Um, it, but you, it, plants are 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 the are the key to that because they're the primary producers. All energy that moves through systems starts with plants capturing light energy, making it into chemical energy, which basically literally fuels the entire system. And then these systems are always changing. Uh, we know in the in the images there on the screen, the left side is sort of a, a stable old growth sort of system that if you came back 10 years later, it's likely to look very much like that. On the right side of the screen, the image there is a log landing with fern weed, Erectites and logs. And you come back in 10 years, it's not going to look like that. It's going to change faster. So the, the relativity of, of change in systems is one of the things that makes us need to monitor. So we know we know there's things are changing. We know they're going somewhere. Monitoring kind of helps us get an idea of where they came from and where they are going. Um, the methodologies that, that that I tend to use, I've used a lot over the years, and 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 my 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 organization has basically become the the data collecting wing for most state and private conservation organizations in uh, in my region at least um, and so we use a lot of different methodologies what i find best is is we tend to use 25 quarter meter quadrats and sort of a grid pattern similar to to the bottom left of the screen um and we we can expand that to, to larger communities like prairies or we can shrink it down into to woodland woodland communities as well uh, the analysis is where the the sort of nuts and bolts come from. We we collect data, but then the question is, what do you do with it when you have it? Um, that's that's the hard part. That's where the interpretation comes in. And so you got to know what you're looking at and what variables are important. There's the the classic traditional diversity variable variables that that most monitoring programs and projects look at. Richness, which is simply the number of species that you might have in a plot or whatever your whatever your uh, sampling design is shannon diversity or some form of diversity this is just the distribution of those species so you have a certain number of species but is are are they distributed evenly or are they all over in one corner diversity explains a lot uh, more stable more complex more mature systems tend to have higher diversity and higher richness um, Dominance is something that I like to look at too. You can look at like the top two or three dominant species, how they change over time. And then something that a lot of people don't use that's less uh, less common is a fluoristic quality assessment. And that's using coefficients of conservatism, C values, it's a number assigned to species zero through 10 uh, based on the, how good of an indicator they are of an intact, old, stable sort of system. Um, so mean C value, the average of those numbers at a plot becomes very important and is kind of the crux of, of interpretation, I think, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll give an example of that in a moment. And then physiognomy, you know, the ratio of annuals, perennials, grasses, forbs, trees, yada, yada, yada. Um, and, and here's the example that, that I like to give. These are traditional variables. You got richness and diversity on an X, Y axis. These are 12 prairie plots of varying condition. And so you've got a nice, nice, strong sort of linear relationship there. And you would interpret that as um, on the bottom left, low diversity prairies in this case, 
uh, tend to also have low richness. And then on the top right, you have a greater diversity, greater number of species. We tend to find this over and over and over. Oops. Um, but the notice the red and black dots at, at the top right, at the very end of the, the end of the line there. Those, from experience and from having collected the data, those are two very different prairies. Um, the the red one is actually closer to an old field. It, it's, it's it's got fescue. It's kind of beat up. Uh, it's an old hay field, an old graze field. The black dot in that case is one of the the highest quality grade A prairies that we have in the region. And so it's odd that those rank so close together. Um, switching slides here, now we've got sort of a, a negative correlation between diversity and dominance. So when you have a dominant species of something's more, if you have something like big blue stem in this case and a prairie that's more common, the more common it is, the more the, the more abundant it is, the less capacity there is for other things to be there. So richness and diversity and things will go down. But again, it, the main point here is that the red and black dots, again, a really poor quality prairie and a high quality prairie are scoring on what you would perceive as to be the better grade. Um, and there's, there's those dots again. So, so you really, you, we're really missing an element here. And that's, that's why we use floristic quality assessment. It, it gives us some directionality to, to management. When we do our monitoring, we can see where something is going, where it's been. And so these, those, those three variables, richness, diversity, and dominance, plotted here against C value on the X axis. So as you go from left to right here, we're increasing in C value, and C value should be later successional, longer lived, more perennial, more stable vegetation types. And so what you find like on the, on the left side here is with diversity, um, that red dot, the prairie that is that red dot, it pops over there on the left side as being lesser quality than on the right side. And, and you get these curvilinear relationships, which are, are themselves just fascinating. Um, but what you, the, the, the take home from this is that richness and diversity, even dominance, aren't really great indicators in and of themselves. You need some sort of qualifier. You need a qualifying variable, which is what C-value is. We qualitatively determine that ragweed is of lower quality than Platanthera ciliaria, a higher C value uh, habitat specific organism. Um, and then when we average those, we get these relationships in different community conditions that we can track and follow over time. And so you, you really need that qualifying variable. The example I often give is I'll sell you 100 cars for $1,000. The first question you should want to know is what is the condition of these cars? The quantity isn't really the point. The quality is is ultimately what you're interested in. When we plot those uh, mean C values, we start seeing this distribution, that curvilinear relationship, um, we, and we start graphing it across uh, really degraded systems and then really high quality systems. We consistently find this curve that, with the, that my staff and I have started calling the floristic integrity curve. And, and the, the main point here with it is that, that system maturation is not linear. We, we tend to think of restoration and things like that as being, okay, we go from point A to point B and that's a straight line, but it's not. There's, there's sort of a hump in the middle. You get to this, I call it the, the dominance trough there, where there's a point at which dominant vegetation overpowers um, annuals, biennials, things like that. And then you start building a second tier into a more stable long-term system. Fun fact, as, as we start looking more into this relationship, we start realizing that this is really a, a nitrogen dynamic. Um, you, can, you can plot this, and we, we started collecting soils along with our monitoring programs to look at nitrogen, at least available nitrogen, nitrate primarily. Um, that change in time, that, that successional gradient, that maturation of living systems tends to pretty strictly follows a, uh, a decreasing available nitrogen. So, so we, can even, we can start thinking of maturing systems or, or whether you have an old, old stable, high quality system, it's probably going to be 
inherently low in available nitrogen. You increase nitrogen, you tend to increase nitrophiles, which are annuals and, and weedy sort of things. So when we monitor, we're kind of inadvertently monitoring, at least with C values, um, the, the change in, in nitrogen availability over time. Um, and so some of the other some of the other results we get from this by looking at C values and looking at nitrogen in systems across long-term projects um, that that the projects I've been involved in, we find several things that, that tend to go against conventional thought. Uh, one is that, at least in the Midwest, somewhat in the Mid-South, non-dormant season fires, uh, so, so spring fires, summer fires, things like that, growing season fires, tend to have negative impacts on the sea value. They increase nitrogen from the ash and char that's from the fire. Uh, another thing, too intense and too frequent of fires have negative impacts and cause mortality, uh, which increases nitrogen. What we also find is healthful fires kind of give you just more of what's already there. Um, I think there's a there's a notion that burning will you know, burn it and they will come. Data from study after study in, in, in our region, in my region at least, shows that you kind of just get more of what was already there, um, which is good. You find, you know, you, you triage places that have a lot or have the most potential, and those are the ones that you should focus on. If you have a degraded sort of woodlot, prairie glade, what have you, um, no amount of fire is going to going to revive it. It's like uh, think of it as the what are the paddles, the defibrillator. You know, if somebody's been flatlined for an hour, you're probably not gonna. You can shock them all you want. It's not gonna do anything. Um, and again, nitrogen's the driver. Of, of a lot of this, of system stability and of system productivity, more than than people, I think, more than I had realized, and more than I, in my training or in in conversation, had had heard of, um, and, and and sort of the the take home of that is is that old growth, mature, open, ecologically complex systems, grassy or wooded, are are inherently low in nitrogen. Um, and, and not necessarily just low in nitrogen, it's usually, it's usually a combination of the ratio of nitrogen to carbon. And it's really, we find when we start doing soil data, we find this 12 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio and pretty much anything 12 to one or, or higher, it's really sort of intact systems, it's less than 12 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio in soils. We start seeing pretty much degraded systems, old fields, ag fields, yada, yada. Um, so that's a, I, I encourage people to start using um, sampling a lot, following the soil changes because these are these are emblematic of microbial dynamics that we we otherwise don't have really a lot of access to. That's that's still in in uh, a science in it, in its infancy. One of the hardest things about monitoring is is what do you do with the data and what do you do with the information you get and and this is where I've bumped against a, a lot of walls over time is that. You know, we collect data thinking that this is a learning process, not a verifying process. We're collecting data, we're monitoring things so that we can change if something isn't working out. We're not collecting data to verify how awesome we are and how perfect the world is. Um, so when you find results that are contrary, the hardest thing about mo monitoring is then affecting change back into um, conventional thought. So, you know, Across the board, and I, and I know very few exceptions, data are chronically ignored when they don't support conventional thought and systems. So anytime you're doing any type of monitoring, I often recommend, and we've done this with a few clients, is to is have a have a like a contractual written agreement that there are fail safes in monitoring that if you hit these trigger points or these thresholds, um the the a reevaluation of what's the, the management methods or the techniques should be uh, should be done, and that way you're not that way you're going into it more scientifically, saying okay, we don't know that this is right, we don't know that we're doing everything perfect. What happens if we aren't? How do we how do we how do we how do we correct? Companies have this. It's called research and development. We're not great at it in conservation, and and I'll end it there. <laughs>